So let's, um, I guess, get started. Um, I know we, um, I think the earlier session, um, there are, might be a few people who are, um, you know, joining in from there soon. Uh, but um, just in the interest of time, uh, would love to get started. And uh, firstly, uh, welcome to uh, this conversation. Um, I think the, uh, the topic is um, a topic where all of us are very keen to understand uh, how can we make a difference to the uh, to really the, the suffering uh, which which has befallen migrant workers, informal workers, and uh, we heard from uh, uh, you know the research that Intelicap has done on on some of the most pressing statistics and issues around that. So um, in this discussion. Um, you know, I'm joined by Rati uh, Forbes, and and we'll try to talk a little bit about uh, you know one potential initiative or solution that we are attempting. And uh, in all humility, I think the reality is uh, this is this has been a challenge uh, which has not got solved for 73 years since our independence. So, so I think the reality is um, how do we make a difference and uh, what are some what are some ways of uh, making sure that uh, uh, we are able to um, really move the needle in a sustainable manner and prevent uh, a recurrence of this uh, this crisis which has uh, befallen migrant workers? Uh, just before we start, uh, I want to quickly introduce. Uh, um, so uh, my name is Anant. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I uh, work in Dasra and uh, past life was in uh, consulting in the for-profit sector. And really, uh, uh, it's a pleasure to interact with all of you and uh, uh, talk a little bit and listen and answer questions around this initiative itself, which is called Social Compact. And we'll talk a little bit more. Uh, before we start, can I uh, request Rati to quickly introduce uh, herself and then we'll get started. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Rati Forbes. I'm uh, part of the Forbes Marshall Group of Companies. We are a manufacturing and engineering company based in Pune. I'm not the engineer in the company. I actually uh, am responsible for the foundation, uh, the community initiatives, but I'm also, my background is in human resources and corporate uh, sustainability. And um, uh, yes, that's my area of passion and work. Thank you. Uh, so just to uh, get us started and, and uh, you know, um, all of us have um, seen and, and, you know, read a different, uh, you know, sort of reports and media articles as well around the migrant crisis. Uh, but I do want to house us first on, on a few important realities. Um, I think the first reality is uh, 270 million informal workers, and and we are we are really keen that this number, uh, you know, we don't forget. Um, informal workers uh, count make up almost 85 percent of India's non-farming workforce, 85 percent, and and of them, about 140 million are migrant workers. So. I think uh, the first reality is uh, it's a very, very large segment of the population. Um, and we have seen uh, how systematically they suffer from gross inequality. Um, and frankly, it has been ignored by our collective conscience. Um, and, and the reason I say that is, personally speaking, um, you know, it happened in front of my eyes in Mumbai. Uh, potentially one of the richest cities globally, had uh, a crisis where uh, millions of informal workers and migrants uh, had almost less paid to them than minimum wage, did not have food, had to trek for long distances. Uh, and, and just to recognize the fact that this is not something which was a one-off. Um, you know, almost 45% of workers in India are paid less than minimum wage. So uh, interestingly, even as you think of uh, some of the most well-known brands um, uh, and, and think of any brand you can think about, think of 
um, a car, think of uh, you know a Honda. There is a car, and then as you think of the value chain, there is a steering wheel. There are the bolts in the steering wheel. As you go further into the value chain, uh, there are informal workers who are actually doing the work, and a very large segment of them don't actually have the uh, you know basic uh, provisions that we take for granted. Um, just to give you a sense uh, of how pervasive this is, uh, and it's important only because, uh, as Rati will also talk in a minute, we have been blind to this. It has been an invisible problem. It has been an invisible challenge. Uh, almost 90% of India's workers, labor force, is unorganized and without access to basic entitlements. Uh, I'm not talking fancy entitlements. I'm talking basic stuff. Um, and, and, and the reality is uh, COVID was almost like a wake-up call, right? COVID was not the cause. This has been there for you know, almost decades. And uh, it is not, it would be brushing things under the carpet to say COVID caused this. COVID made this visible, made this invisible issue visible. But this issue has been there for a long time. And, and just to give you a sense again of some statistics which are helpful, 50% uh, of the workers had rations left for less than one day after the first few days of lockdown. Uh, while all of us, many of us, were privileged to be able to work at home and all of that, uh, having a less than a day of rations is something, uh, you know, one, one can't even begin to imagine. And I think the reality is, um, you know, one doesn't know the number, but a very large number of people traversed on foot uh, towards their native villages because they recognize that there is, you know, basic, basic amenities and provisions are not there. Now, as we think of all this, I think what, you know, what it did was it caused an upswell of relief efforts. And I think that's great. And that's absolutely needed. And it was needed. Uh, but, you know, I think the reality is if we stop at relief, and that is what I think, um, uh, you know, coming from Mumbai, that's something which, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's both a plus and minus. We forget our crises too fast. And uh, the reality is uh, the lockdown and the crisis brought together two very unlikely groups uh, who till then had almost considered themselves on opposite poles. On one side, the civil society and NGOs who champion for the rights of migrant workers, and, and then the industry you know, employers who employ the migrant workers and informal workers. I think what happened because of the COVID crisis is it really brought the conscience of uh, the country to the fore, and it almost forced us to acknowledge. Uh, and, and in fact, we'll talk a little bit about how that was the reason this initiative was born. It forced two very unlikely parties to become allies and to figure out how to solve this jointly. Uh, it's not easy. It has not been solved for 73 years of independence. Uh, and, and it is one of those uh, initiatives where uh, unless we all work together, uh, you know, it is not unlikely that another 73 years will not solve it. So it is one of those where two parties have come together. And I think the reality is why this is critical is there are laws, there are uh, legal uh, you know, uh, 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 safeguards, uh, but did you know that there are actually 6,000 labor inspectors uh, in the country? And, and you know, obviously, how can we expect 6,000 labor inspectors, how can we expect this to be solved if this is just a matter of law and not a matter of conscience? So as we you know, uh, started thinking about what to do and I'd almost say this was uh, led by the NGOs who have been championing for the rights of migrant workers for a long time, such as Ajivika Bureau. Um, and, 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 and the reality is uh, it became clear unless we work together with uh, you know, ethical industries, uh, this will not be solved. So just to give you a sense of what is the social compact, uh, very simply put, the social compact is uh, you know, aiming to say that how can there be a life of dignity and equity for one million informal workers and work women? 
um, you know, uh, we should remember that there is a very large number of women who are actually part of this workforce. Uh, and how can we make it happen, starting with a small pilot, but then scaling up to 150 companies in India over the next five years? And how do we make it happen so that this is not a relief? This is not because there's a crisis, but this becomes something which becomes uh, after, you know, maybe 10 years, five years, this becomes something that people stop discussing as a great thing. And this is considered as, yeah, of course, this needed to be done and it was done. Uh, very simply put, the social compact, if successful, is going to focus on five outcomes. One is really ensure living wages that enable a life of dignity to ensure that, you know, there are safety nets around life altering accidents and health benefits. Uh, we should know that as COVID hit, uh, people without you know, any salaries had burdens in addition of one lakh to uh, sort of pay for. Uh, and imagine how terrible that is. Thirdly, really participate uh, and create opportunities for upskilling. And, and this is important because as, as we want to make sure that uh, this is sustainable, uh, making sure that the informal workers are able to participate in the future of work, uh, like uh, the uh, research by Intellicap has shown, uh, is important. Fourthly, to ensure gender mainstreaming in pay, in treatment, in opportunities, uh, ensuring that there is uh, addressal and very strong actions against harassment, etc. but to make sure that that is addressed. And lastly, to make sure that this becomes a topic where we can come together as a movement. Um, so, you know, uh, as, as we thought about this, uh, we realize that, look, this will not happen if only one party works, one entity works. It will not happen if this is an industry-led initiative. It will not happen if it's only an NGO-led initiative. So how do we make it happen? We recognize that uh, this will only happen if different parties come together. And, and very simply put, it started with the informal worker, the migrant worker at the center and NGOs who have spent decades working with them, really advocating for them. And uh, in this, uh, there was a leadership role played by Ajivika Bureau, Jan Sahas, and Center for Social Justice. And many of them have been championing for the rights of migrant workers for a very long time, very successfully. Secondly, uh, this, this brought together industry leaders and uh, you know who, who are doing this because it's the right thing to do want to go beyond doing this only in their own organizations. So we had Godrej, Thermax, Forbes, Marshall, and Rati will speak a little bit about that. We also recognize that tapping into industry bodies such as CII, uh, such as I'm Ahmedabad, these are important actions. And of course, as Dasra, uh, making sure that this happens with some degree of agility, some degree of program management, and some degree of focus uh, because it's not easy to bring together such diverse groups on a common ambition. Um, and, and just before, uh, you know, sort of get, giving a sense of uh, uh, what have been some of the uh, big aha moments, uh, it, is being, it is following a fairly simple process of saying, let us take three cities. And we have taken Mumbai, Pune, and Ahmedabad. Let us take 15 organizations in these and actually go through a process in which we can co-create, keeping the voice of the migrant at the center, what is the current situation? Uh, and not just looking at the factory gates and what's happening inside the factory, but looking at the full value chain. Because like I said in the beginning, a very large number, 80 to 90% of the informal workers actually participate in the value chain and vendor networks outside the factory gates. And then as this pilot gains momentum, as we get insights, as we put runs on the board to actually scale up beyond these three cities and move from 15 companies to 150 um, organizations. Um, so with that, let me uh, you know, stop sharing and uh, uh, maybe uh, bring a couple of perspectives as we did this. I think uh, one perspective which was pretty interesting was uh, the concept of this being focused on a city level. And what I mean by that is, is 
it said that, look, at a city level, there are NGOs who are working with migrant labor. There are business leaders who are keen to make a difference. How do we bring them together? And how do we also connect them with associations and other organizations in that city? So it's a city level movement. Uh, and the reason we consciously chose to go deep in a city is because you know, if we are able to do this well in a city, let's say Pune, and it builds momentum, it's a very replicable model because these networks exist in multiple cities. Um, I think the second point is, uh, as we are doing this, we are also thinking of how do we create a business case for this? It's not just charity, it is the cost of doing good business. And I think that is important because if this is considered charity, it will not work. But if this is considered a cost of doing good business, then business leaders will embrace this because one wants to do the right thing. And the last point uh, before I bring in Rati is we really would love to get inputs, but think of this as a movement. None of us believe that this can work if we are only doing it, but we believe that if we work together, maybe this is something where we can create momentum in multiple cities and go deeper in these cities as well and start creating something where, of course, there are rules, of course, there are legal safeguards the government is putting in place and all that is very useful. But this is going way beyond and saying, can the civil society and the industry come together to do the right thing, keeping the migrants at the center and, and solve this from a perspective of a long-term initiative and a long-term sustainable initiative and not just as relief. So that's a little bit of what is the social compact, why this started, what we are trying to achieve uh, and, and where we are right now uh, on this. Um, you know, as, as we go through, please keep sharing your questions, but I'd love to bring in Rati uh, to share some perspectives. Uh, Rati, uh, from both your personal uh, aspect as well as from the organizational aspect. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thanks very much, Anand, for uh, setting the context so effectively. Uh, makes my task a bit simpler, and I'm going to really talk more about the practical aspect or how we have seen it uh, kind of rolling out in in our own organization and in Pune also. So, uh, you know, I think like everybody else, uh, we were reading these reports in the media uh, because we have supported NGOs in the past. We were reading research reports that were coming up, coming in uh, in droves. And we saw all these very, um, uh, these vulnerable folk, the photos we saw, uh, it couldn't help but move all of us. Um, I want to just say what we had been doing in any case in our own organization. So when we looked, uh, when the pandemic struck and when we had the lockdown uh, from the end of March, uh, we looked at it that our overall approach should be not just the safety, security and the resilience of just our own employees and their families, but also, uh, you know, the great, the larger ecosystem of customers, vendors, as well as uh, communities around our factory and, of course, our contractual workers. Uh, being in the manufacturing and engineering space, we do, do not have huge um, droves of contract workers like you have in the construction industry, but we certainly do have them. So um, the first thing is one of the first things we did in the first quarter was to actually repurpose one of our uh, smaller units into an isolation center and a quarantine center. Not just Forbes, my employees and their families it up to all. Um, I was personally very involved with our local uh, municipal corporator, as well as a very um, a thoughtful leader we have as a CEO of our local uh, Pune district, um, where we actually catalyze the public distribution scheme in the Pune district. And that's when a lot of uh, facts actually came off the paper, and I actually saw what was happening. Um, I will go into that in a little more detail in a bit. In a bit. Uh, we also, as a company and as a family decided that we were going to support small enterprises. And by small enterprises, I mean, uh, we have supported uh, 
people who, you know, just do snacks and food stuff to people who have also done signboards and, you know, a gamut of them. But we gave them advance orders, some and tried to understand each one's needs individually. Um, and in some cases, it was very, very low amounts of money that were involved. Some people had to just close shop and find places to store their stuff. And those were the kind, uh, so we just tried to understand through our HR department and my own uh, team, what were the actual needs and where could we support and help even for short bursts and periods of time. And then finally, as I said earlier, we made sure that in our contracts that we have, and as we all know, we all work through a main contractor, we made sure that in we, that every contract worker down the line was paid. You know, it's very easy to say that I have paid my contract bill to for our security, your cafeteria, and so on. But we also did some spot checks to make sure that down the line, two people were being paid. And then finally, of course, we repurposed our cafeteria at the behest of our, our local cooperator and uh, we had meals going out and I know many many companies did that I just wanted to set that backdrop because just coming to the social compact uh, I think all this really was in our face and made us see how vulnerable so many sort of thousands or tens of thousands even in our city were. Um, and it is not just migrants who have come in from Bihar, Rajasthan or whatever. I even saw that when I talked about the public distribution scheme, that these were interested migrants. They were people who had actually come in from poorer parts of Maharashtra. And so it was almost like an imperative that when we heard uh, Dasra talk and we realized that it was, you know, time for action rather than just reading and feeling very, uh, you know, sad and uh, empathetic towards these communities. And so we had first conversations with other industry uh, bodies and in, uh, sorry, I should say more industry leaders in our own city who are both friends as well as we work together on many uh, kind of industry issues across the city and in the state. Um, it, the other way, the second thing was that unemployment rates, as we all know, were almost at a peak of 30% in April and May. And then there were issues that we realized about, like Anand said, the data that we saw uh, where people were left with <clears throat> not even enough money to recharge their phone as they walked. Um, finally, I want to say that uh, personally, uh, from our foundation, as well as personally, we have been involved for many, many years working with NGOs uh, who work on the ground, such as uh, the ones that uh, Anand mentioned, but also with people like Mobile Crash that works at, mob at construction workers sites. And we thought that it was time very much for industry also to come forward and not just keep supporting these wonderful initiatives, but how can we have a broader, more sustainable sustainable approach. So I think what's unique about the social compact from my lens is that it is really a sustainable approach uh, with the aspiration that at least 1 million plus families would be certainly impacted over the next three to five years. Um, I think the other piece is that it applies the way it has been framed. It applies to all industry types. It is not only for the large FMCGs, but it also is very applicable to an SME and an ME. And I will come to that in a bit. It has a very flexible template that has been sort of co-created by not only an Ajibika, I mean, I'm just mentioning them because they've worked for so many years, but it has really kept the migrant or the vulnerable worker at its core when it has been, been designed. So it is not coming from an industry lens, but really from the lens of the person who is, or the families that have been the most impacted and affected. Um, I, uh, from the beginning, I think we have realized that it's got a sort of a, it, it has a self-assessment approach. So it's not like Big Brother, uh, NGO, or some external force is looking in on you and policing you. It's a self-assessment form that we in industry fill up. Um, it is an approach for you yourself to understand uh, where you are, the gaps that you may like to fill, and then what is nice is each of us have been allocated or linked to an NGO. And uh, that 
NGO can actually help us. Uh, in, uh, if our, in our own uh, company, we found that many of these are mandated schemes um, that are sort of um, imperatives from the government over the years. Um, and I think that for us, uh, some of them, we had very few gaps, but we're trying to think about if we are saying that these are basics that we have for our own employees in our company, why should there be a different set of standards for people who are also working on our shop floor or in our cafeteria or in our garden uh, who do not have access to these same facilities? And I think that's where the social compact really comes in for us. Um, I think it is also one other unique one is that I think we had to look at it also from the lens of industry. As we all know, industry is going through its own pains and challenges. And why would an industry take two steps out and um, think about spending some more money at this stage? Honestly, it is not a lot of money or a lot of extra additional money that one is spending by becoming a part of this, uh, you know, by being a signatory to the social compact. Um, I think one already we have seen in the last few months that there have been very excellent learnings from each other in industry. Um, already there has been good uptake from networks like CII, FICI, and we, the aspiration is that we do not want uh, industry associations, associations and companies to just sign, but really how can they make changes, even small incremental changes over months or over a year and um, really live it by, by the letter. Finally, I just want to give a small initiative that we've even done at the city level, which has, is already uh, showing much impact. Uh, I think you probably read in the media about national level helplines that have been set up to track and for migrants to call in. But at the local level also in Pune, we realized that there were several migrants and we are talking about, again, I'm saying intrastate as well as out of state people. Um, I don't know how much we can do very honestly about very informal migrants, like those who are in a local Chaika Dukan or in a small stall, but the greater majority of them do work for manufacturing industries like ours. And so this, what this local helpline has already done is it's with the, um, uh, it's being run by a local NGO that has a very good feel for our city, was also very involved with uh, bringing back migrants uh, on buses or helping them to reach their homes when they were um, uh, when they were walking, um, they did. They were also involved with a lot of the meals and all of those pieces that we know about. Um, and what we've done is the helpline currently has just two people, uh, but it was really interesting to see that from all the calls that we have received in the last 60 days, almost 30 to 35% of them are from migrants who just don't have the requisite paperwork. So if I cannot access the most basic scheme that I'm entitled to, um, how would I, how, how can I even move forward? Uh, and I think the, we, we underestimate, unfortunately, that most people are so, um, are just unable to even fill forms. Uh, they do not have a smartphone, which gives them access to, uh, you know, putting all of this in digitally, which you, one is now supposed to do. And so this helpline has really been a support in a way to almost 30 to 35% of the calls that we have received uh, thus far. Um, Anant, I'll stop there and... Well, thank you. Um, and um, um, I'm just picking up uh, a question uh, and comment from uh, Samar. Thank you so much, Samar, for um, uh, articulating uh, this. Um, and and um, very quickly, um, because that question has gone up in the chat window, but Samar said two things, I think. One was, uh, you know, uh, just uh, thinking of the multi-stakeholder perspective and could not agree more. Like, not just the migrant workers at the center, the industry, the NGOs, but also consumers. Yeah, also investors. And, and, um, and then Samar's second question was, um, what about the cost implication? Um, and, and if I could just, um, you know, uh, share this perspective and then 
would love to bring you in as well, Rati, um, and, and you, you put it quite well, which is, um, you know, um, as we were thinking about this, and this is, as you can guess, this is work in progress, we are working on it. Um, what we are seeing is there could be many drivers for organizations to adopt it. But before we get into that, I think we, we, have, to, we have to create a belief that we have to move from callous capitalism to conscious capitalism. It's very important. Just to give you a sense, the total cost structure for the people part is close to eight to 10% for many organizations. That means out of the total cost, if it was 100 rupees, eight to 10 rupees is the people cost. It varies a little bit here and there. Of that, the informal workers part might be, you know, the kind of initiatives like Rati said, may not be more than 1%, right? So it's not actually a huge cost implication, but that small cost can have a huge impact on A, legal compliance. Uh, it can have a huge positive impact on the brand itself, right? And uh, over time, there are good learnings from Goodweave. There are learnings from the Apparel Coalition on how the brand has actually strengthened. Thirdly, there could be benefits in terms of retention of the workers themselves. I think fourthly, just making sure that this is aligned to the global standards could have benefits from the investor community point of view. But lastly, also the fact that consumers themselves and very importantly, employee engagement can improve because uh, you know, I think especially, uh, uh, I think all of us, but especially the uh, younger generation really wants to you know, participate in organizations that are uh, doing good. So, so in a way, um, thank you Summer for bringing this point. I guess, I guess um, you know, uh, success would be if we are able to uh, position all of these benefits. Uh, of course, some organizations uh, may have more focus on one versus the other, uh, but, but as, as, uh, as can we change the dialogue, like you're saying, into saying, yes, you might have to pay more. It's a little bit like safety. One might have to service the lift a little more to make sure the lift doesn't collapse. But frankly, that's a small cost to pay or the benefits that one has uh, through the process itself. So, uh, but, but did want to just make, uh, thank you for that question. Um, uh, I'd love to, before we, uh, we had a poll, but I can already see some questions uh, up there. Um, I'd love to uh, you know, bring uh, anyone who'd like to um, just ask a question or contribute something. Um, and uh, uh, maybe, you know, uh, Somatish, if I can request you, to start us off, uh, maybe we can take a few thoughts and questions and then we'll go to the poll. Thank you. Nat, can I just have a quick comment there? Yes, please. I think please. Uh, apart from, you know, uh, I started to talk about what we had done in our own company. Uh, let me just say that it was such a, uh, a positive for us because when the when industry as industry, we were able to open from almost day one, we were back to in a way normal because none of our well i would say i can count on the ha fingers of one hand the workforce or our informal workforce who had left they were all still there they had not gone back to their homes and uh, this was a huge plus for us in our organization whereas i know that there are hundreds of or thousands of others who were not able to start and we are still having uh, NGOs local NGOs actually help to bus people back because the tra local trains haven't started so I want to say that there are many many uh, pluses or positives that happen as a result of just more thoughtful approaches or initiatives as this please back to you So, Vatish, I don't know whether you can hear us, but uh, would love to hear your thoughts. Uh, yes, thank you so much, Anand. No, I just wanted to, hi. I just want to kind of, uh, I mean, first of all, you know, kind of uh, really appreciate you sharing uh, with us about this uh, particular initiative. And it's really, really interesting. Um, so, uh, what I was also thinking that, uh, you know, it was, since we're talking about uh, a subset of workers, you know, uh, informal workers and formalizing them, uh, essentially the sense that I was getting is that we're kind of largely looking at the labor force who uh, are in some way connected to, you know, a formalized, uh, some, uh, a, a company or a set of companies, be it in manufacturing or those kind of industries. 
uh, I was just thinking that can this concept also, uh, you know, in uh, over the next few years also think of uh, certain uh, workers who are kind of agnostic by the nature of their work, you know, for example, waste pickers, they might be aligned to an industry, but not necessarily a particular company or a set of companies. So can we also look at them? And I feel that, you know, the kind of, uh, 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 you know, uh, NGOs that we are talking about, I'm sure there are a lot of NGOs who are actually focusing on uh, this set of workers or subset of workers. I also feel that, uh, you know, the, uh, the struggle uh, that we are talking about, you know, when we are talking, when we are saying that, you know, a particular industry is, you know, has gone slow, affecting the, you know, first set of workers who are connected to a particular company, they used to supply something, for example, they used to work on a daily wage at a manufacturing site. Uh, I think if you, uh, uh, if you compare them with the waste pickers, uh, I don't know, maybe the plight would be even more, plight of those workers could be even more, you know, worse. That's one. Um, second point, I second question I had was that uh, the moment you start looking at uh, these workers and engaging with them and try to kind of, kind of formalize them uh, in some way and take care of their well-being and get all the different partners, including the companies on board, uh, perhaps going forward, there is also this element of entrepreneurship that we can imbibe, not in all of them, but maybe in a subset of those workers and create, try to kind of... Uh, motivate them and build their capacities to become micro entrepreneurs. So sure, sure. No, thank you so much. And um, um, uh, I think you hit the nail on the head, uh, Somatish. And I'm also um, looking at uh, what Kinjal has written. And I think one of the good news, I'd say, again, it's not easy, is in this catchment of uh, organizations, we are including MSMEs as well. Uh, and also what we are doing is, as we pick up even a larger organization, we are expanding and we want to expand deep into the value chain. So just to, I think, Kinjal's point, uh, and this is a very critical point, uh, the principal manufacturer or the principal organization can be a very large one, let's say a Honda, but there are actually three to four tiers who supply to a Honda, and that's where the informal workers actually work. So as we are working with the principal employer, we are also you know, defining what is the landscape of the informal workers? And of course, uh, this all depends on organizations' own uh, willingness and you know, their own vision, but how can they influence their value chain uh, to go deeper? And this is a very critical point, which uh, Kinjal, you made, uh, thank you, which is the reason almost 85% of non-farm labor actually works in informal work is because of the value chains, which means while the first principle is always visible. Uh, you know, the value chain is where the informal work uh, uh, comes in. And as we do this, I think uh, I'm also sort of looking at, uh, you know, uh, the comment on saying, look, there have always been rules from the government. And, you know, the reality is uh, even in a best intentioned way, uh, unless the market forces pick this up, unless the NGOs champion and all, unless the consumers come in, I think government has a role to play. But can we all actually come into this and, and actually push this into the zone in which this is something which must be done because it's the right thing to do, not because we uh, you know, want to uh, be on the right side of the law alone. So no, thank you for these comments, which I can see um, on the screen. Um, so I know that we only have 15 minutes and uh, this is a topic which is quite uh, engaging and interesting. I did want to leave the group with some do's and don'ts, learnings that we have had, because I think it's not all rosy. Uh, I think the reality is uh, uh, one of the, and I, maybe I can start with a few and then Rati bring you in. But uh, from my personal perspective, starting with um, a shared intent, I think again, uh, Summer, I can see that you, you alluded to that. You know, the only way, uh, and again, it's, I'm not even saying we are like one third of the way there, but even the little success we have had so far is because uh, unless one elevates the dialogue to say this is the shared intent, we all believe that we cannot uh, you know, uh, ignore the fact that a very large group of people who are living next to us um, you know, uh, continue living in such inequity and indignity. So I think the shared intent was something which was very powerful because uh, that brings together very diverse stakeholders. 
and I think the second thing which I was personally very inspired was this continuously goes back to saying, you know, can we put the migrant workers or informal workers at the center? Um, uh, we are doing this not because it's charity. We are doing this not because of uh, legal compliance. Of course, you know, we, we will do more than that. But how do we make sure the migrant workers and the informal workers fundamentally move into a zone in which they are not sitting in such high risk? So I think these were the two big learnings. And the one mistake that we made, and I think uh, we, we learned, is uh, unless we make sure that we uh, go deeper and focus on quality, which means uh, it's very easy for initiatives like this to become tokenistic. You know, big targets are declared. Uh, you all know how it is, right? So unless we make sure every organization we are doing this actually believes in it, it's true data, uh, it's very easy to get into the zone in which, you know, success is declared, but actually nothing changes. So I think, uh, and I really appreciate both the NGOs and the industry's leaders who have said quality is more important than quantity in this situation. Um, so these were the three learnings, two successes and one mistake. Uh, but Rati, I'd love to get your thoughts as well. Uh, no, thanks. Um, I just thought I, I know that the Sankalp audience is also um, one that is, more, you know, not just looking at just philanthropy, but also looking at how can businesses be more responsible, but also, I think like some of you talked about, um, you know, why would, uh, you know, what is the cost benefit and so on. And I've just uh, sort of been thinking about this some more and I, I want to just share these just these are some random thoughts with you guys. Um, one is that we've realized uh, one of the challenges is that in most industries, we're not dealing with just in for individual workers. We have to really work with contractors and the main contractors and the contractual services that we have to actually sensitize train and expand their services. So because they are in every case, pretty much the key facilitators for all the entitlements and everything sort of uh, trickles down through them. So uh, I think we need to do much, much more with this constituent, which we have not, I, at, as far as my knowledge goes, we have not. Uh, even the NGOs that we have worked with seem to be working with different um, individual audiences or families, but not at the larger contractor level. So that's a learning and one that we need to perhaps improve on. Um, I think the local helpline that we've had in Pune has been a real um, huge learning for us. And I would only like to see it grow and develop. And I think the necessity to have more of these localized kind of initiatives are important. The third is um, in India, unfortunately, there's no kind of a, 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 you know, framework for the right to housing or the right to health for an informal worker, which makes it really difficult to acquire shelter, to acquire basic health. And it's intermediaries and contractors in these cases that have really made hay. So uh, how can we at some stage and slowly but gradually change uh, change the conversation on that. And finally, I think as a woman myself, I think we have seen that women in all the research as well as all the conversations that we've had, we see that women really face disproportionate challenges. Uh, number one is they have 20 to 30% lower wages in any of the industries where they work. Uh, there's a complete lack of sanitation as we all know, and even the most basic housing. Um, there are big safety issues for women and many of them face safety issues when it when they are still back at home in their villages uh, because the uh, the ma man of the home is away in the city uh, working and finally for the informal workforce that we are talking about their lack, lack complete lack of any kind of sexual harassment at workplace norms that we now take as a you know as an almost like a given in any industry so i think these are some of the challenges but not insurmountable ones that we need to work towards changing as well as we build this out
Thank you so much. Um, so, you know, um, we have a poll and I apologize if you've already been through many polls, but uh, this, is, this is hopefully short and sweet. So I'm requesting, yeah, thank you. So the first question just is uh, as, as uh, you know, as uh, either people who are in the sector, civil society or business leaders or investors or advisors, uh, do you feel, and this is a very personal question, do you personally feel that uh, you have a critical role to play in enabling uh, truly a sustainable life of dignity, equity for migrants and formal workers? Um, it'll be good to just get um, either a yes, no, maybe on, on this. Uh, and then we have one more question there. We are at 62%, so, and, and please be frank. I mean, it's, it's absolutely fine to put maybe or, or no as well, um, um, but we do want to know. Okay, so um, I think we finished the poll. So, okay, so I think first hurdle crossed. I think as an intent, we want to do this. I think the second question will really help because as we are thinking of the innovations, um, if, if uh, Anya, you could help uh, with the second question. Uh, uh, and, and the first question, essentially, um, you know, um, at least the 26 people who are, and again, this is a, uh, this is a little bit of an audience who has come to join this because they believe in it. But as we take this ahead, I think uh, I really uh, underline Summer's point, which is if, if we can actually change the narrative to talking about conscious capitalism and focusing on this not as charity, not as a heroic relief effort, and those are important. Charity is important and heroic relief efforts are important, but this is not that. This is talking of actually make this in, making this a business as usual. Um, so it'll be good to get your thoughts on which of these three ideas resonate with you um, in order to, and we'd love to get your feedback. So we will double down more there uh, and we can also connect offline. So the first is, city-based theaters or city-based groups of business leaders, NGOs, uh, industry associations focusing on, on doing this. Um, second one is really that collaboration. And uh, if I can expand, not just industry, civil society, but also consumers potentially. Uh, and thirdly, um, using principles such as the balance sheet, triple balance sheet, which is you know not just the profits, but also the human aspect, as well as the uh, the ecosystem aspects as well. Um, um, it'll be good to just get a sense of what resonates. Great, thanks. Um, you know, we, we, I'm gonna stop the poll at 60, 62%, okay. Um, I, I think this is interesting, uh, you know, uh, as, as we think about the triple balance sheet, I think it'll be very helpful. Uh, I know we don't have enough time for discussing in detail, but to connect even offline subsequently on how to make that, because uh, I, think, I think the critical point is, uh, how can this be not yet another dialogue of saying there is no cost to this? No, there is a cost to this. It's a very small cost compared to the benefit, but um, I think it's good to hear the feedback from the group saying focus on the triple balance sheet to make the case and you know focus on this because it is it is it has got much more benefits than costs. Uh, so no, we, uh, with that uh, I know we have uh, almost run out of time, but uh, I did want to uh, open up for any uh, maybe last one or two comments or questions from the audience uh, uh, and do please reach out to. Um, Megha, myself, uh, or Rati uh, for any follow-on discussions or questions. We're happy to share. All of the work we're doing is open sourced. Uh, so we'll be very happy to do that. Uh, but any any quick reactions or questions? Summer, any thoughts from your side, if you're on? Okay. 
Hi, Anand. Just to uh, to congratulate you and uh, um, and Rafiji for I think it's been a phenomenal uh, conversation. It's very rare to see, uh, if I may say, unconventional partnerships of the kind that is visible uh, here. Uh, and I I think that's the way way for you know carving out the future where businesses are future ready with workers at the heart. Uh, of businesses, uh, you know, nothing about us without us kind of an approach, I think would be uh, one excellent value-based approach to creating the businesses for future. And that, if there's one lesson that we have learned from COVID-19, I certainly think that's one of the lessons we've learned. So I just want to congratulate you, uh, you know, and uh, Ratiji for an excellent conversation that you've started, social compact, the way you've described Anant, I think is exactly the right way to go. And I look forward to learning more as your work progresses and, you know, wherever possible, uh, joining hands too. So thank you very much. Well, thank you so much and really appreciate everyone joining. And uh, Megha has put her email ID, megha.dasra.org. But again, please reach out. And I think this is just the beginning and we'd love to get inputs, co-creation, but also participation. Um, uh, because it, it is a beginning of hopefully a longer journey. So we can jointly do what we have not been able to do in the last 73 years. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, uh, Rati, and thank you, uh, uh, team uh, Sankal, uh, for really helping set this up.